I want to talk to you today about um, building scalable backends using the actor model and um, Aka.net more specifically. So what's on the agenda for today? Wait, I'm quickly going to move a window here that's in my way. Uh, okay. So what's on the agenda? I'm going to dive in a little bit of history. I'll give you a brief introduction into what Aka.net really is. Um, I'll explain a problem domain that we tried uh, to solve with it, and then we'll dive into how we made that work. Um, I'll probably have more content than we can fit into an hour, um, but you can always hit me up in the hallway um, afterwards. So, why do we even have frameworks like Aka.net? Well, in the 70s, people did research, and like a lot of the things that we are using today, um, it was invented back then. I think it was probably because they were less distracted by, by social media and smartphones, and they probably had better drugs. Um, but it was invented in the 70s, and the ideas were refined throughout the 70s and into the early 80s. Um, yet, we've only seen it in practice only over the last decade or so. Well, it's not entirely true. Um, the first real application of the actor model um, was done by Ericsson. Um, because they, are running, they were running the telco world back then. And the way it worked back then, because now you all have these uh, phone plans where your voice calls are basically free, but they were charging by the connection and by the minute. So it meant that downtime was costing money. So uptime was everything. So they wrote a programming language, because there wasn't a language that could do this. They actually made the Ericsson language, hence the name, Erlang, that had an actor model built into it. Because they figured if they could use this and its self-healing capabilities, um, they could build a telco system that had like the craziest of uptimes. So they wrote software that was about 2 million lines of code and they achieved nine nines of uptime. And to put that into perspective, that is 31 milliseconds a year of downtime. I don't know who has an application that has this kind of uptime. Yeah, none of us, right? So that's interesting. I found that really triggering. That's why I dove into this. And then, um, since the 80s, there were a couple of implementations of the actor model, um, like Akka on the JVM has been around a little bit longer uh, uh, since 2010. Uh, but in, in .NET, we got three of them over the course of a few months. We got Microsoft Orleans, um, the actor model they built to build the backend of Halo 4. Um, we got that released to the public in February. Then we had Akka.net's uh, Akka first production release um, in the same period. And when we also got, it's not a real actor model, but we got Service Fabric uh, Reliable Actors. Um, so it makes you wonder, like, why 2015? Because this has been around since the 70s, but we've gotten three of them in 2015 in the .NET ecosystem. And on even in other ecosystems, they've only, like, really the last decade or so. So why? I mean, classic scaling had come under stress. We ran applications like this for decades before we actually moved into the, the, the cloud stuff. It's like you might have a load balancer and then a couple of production servers beha behind it and a database cluster and maybe like a caching cluster if, if that wasn't sufficient. And a lot of the scaling came from free it came for free because they would release a faster processor every year and a faster processor meant you could just upgrade the machine and you could handle w more workload and because a lot of these applications were running inside enterprises the the potential for like a huge peak increase in usage wasn't that big but then we had the web and we had smartphones and we had the an internet of things and you can now have an app and it might get featured on the app store and you might go from 2,000 users to 2 million users over the course of a day, and your backend has to be able to deal with that. That's a whole different set of problems. And there is something that's really working against us. This is like the processor data over the course of four decades. Um, and what we see here is not really a cause for optimism. Because single-thread performance is flattening out, 
clock frequency has stabilized for more than a decade. So we had Pentium 4s that we could overclock with liquid nitrogen to, to 5 gigahertz. We can't really get that much for, uh, further today. Um, and there's only one of the metrics here that is actually cause for hope. And that is the number of cores. When I started out as a programmer, it was very typical that your desktop had like a single core, like Pentium 3 or Pentium 4, whatever. Um, now you probably have six or eight or even 12 cores in, in, in your pocket on your phone. So that's an evolution that we would like to take advantage of. But taking advantage of multiple cores means that we have to parallelize our code. And there's always problems, because if you start parallelizing code uh, in multiple threads, it means that any shared state is going to cause you a headache. Because if you're accessing shared state, you might run into race conditions, which means that if you have one to avoid that, you're going to have to invent some kind of locking mechanism um, that might cause deadlocks, but that's also a cause for a little bit of your code that cannot be parallelized. And that serialized code is what is actually hurting you the most. Because Amdahl's law says that we can only speed up a system by so much and the percentage of serializable code is like the metric that will hurt you the most. If you can parallelize 95% of your code, which is already a pretty good number, if you can parallelize 95% of it, it doesn't matter that you throw 30,000, 50,000 CPUs at it, you can never increase the workload by more than times 20. Because that 5% of the code always has to run in series. So with this, we're going to need like way higher parallelization if we want to have something that scales across multiple cores, multiple machines, and so on. We want to parallelize workloads as much as we can. And that's a promise that these actor models are giving us. They promise us a crazy degree of parallelization um, also for stateful systems, because a stateless system is very, very easy to, to parallelize. But as soon as you're dealing with state, that's when it becomes tricky. And that is where the actor model brings us a couple of uh, solutions to that problem. They do so by using reactive patterns. Um, and the fault tolerance, as we discussed in the Ericsson slide a couple of slides ago, is built in. You can make it extremely resilient. I'll get to how they do that in a couple of minutes. Um, but these are the promises that we get, right? Everybody with me? So let's dive into how that works um, in code. The basic building block of an actor system is um, an actor. And an actor is just a simple instance uh, of a class. And it has an inbox. You can send messages to the inbox of an actor. And they will get processed one by one in order. On a single thread. But the cool thing is that there's always only going to be a single message being processed on that instance. So inside of your actor, you don't have to care about other threads or race conditions or so on, because you know that you're the only thread who is manipulating the state at that moment. So all of the behavior and the state that the actor needs has to be internal to the actor. And other actors can only access it by sending a message to the actor and getting a reply back. And that we way we make sure that this, there's only a single thread running on this. This is a really, really powerful con uh, concept. Um, and that is what, what makes it easy to do. Now, writing an actor in code is really easy. You just inherit from the untyped actor class. Damn, this is really the biggest screen I've ever been in front. In front. Um, you have the untyped actor. Um, this is like the simplest one you have in ACA.NET. Uh, there's plenty more. We'll see a couple of them in a minute. And you impl implement the on receive. And then messages come in and yeah, you'll, you'll just receive all the messages that have been sent to this actor and you can do something with them. Like this is it. You just have to check what type of message you're getting and then do something with it. Now these messages, they're also very, very simple objects. I mean, in ACA.NET, nothing enforces you to do anything. They just have to be a .NET object. Um, now the thing is, the ACA.NET runtime doesn't force your messages to be immutable, um, but it's a very, very bad idea to make them mutable anyway. Uh, because they might cross a machine boundary, 
And then they get serialized and, and deserialized, which means that whatever you were trying to do by still manipulating the message will no, no longer work. So they claim that you can get um, 50 million messages a second on a single machine. They're talking about a server. I can reliably get like 2 million on my four-year-old uh, four laptop. So I think that claim is probably pretty true. Um, now, in .NET, you might want to design your messages to be um, fully, um, fully immutable by making all the properties only settable in the constructor. But when you deal with um, collections, it's a very good idea to use the immutable collections um, so that you cannot change the content of the uh, collection object after the message has been instantiated. And then you're sure that everything that goes in there is immutable can cross, cross a machine boundary if it has to without causing you a headache. Now, the thing that ties all of this together is the actor system. And luckily, that's the work that we don't have to do. Um, the actor system is basically what keeps all your actors in the air. It will instantiate your actors based on um, a, a sort of um, constructor pointer. Um, it will construct them for you. It will destruct them for you. Um, it will handle all those inboxes and all the messages um, and it will do the thread scheduling for you. And that's the part that we would hate doing because it's very complicated and we can hand that over to the people who made the system. There's also a, a publish subscribe event bus, not going to dive into that today, but it's there. Um, so it does a lot of awesome things. It's basically the puppet master of your software system. And this is like the first Metallica album I bought when it came out uh, a while ago. Um, now, creating an actor system in code is really, really easy. Um, you do actor system.create and you give it a name. And that's pretty much all of it. If you want to start spawning actors inside your actor system, you're going to have to use props. And the easiest way to think about props is a constructor pointer. It will tell you how to construct your actor. And now I'm using the default constructor because I'm not passing any parameter, uh, parameters. But any um, constructor parameters that you want to pass to that actor, you can pass in the props. And what you get when you do actor off on your actor system, which creates a top level actor um, with the props that we just made, um, you get an actor ref back. You don't get the actual actor. You just have a reference object that allows you to talk to the actor. And that allows you to send messages to it or to communicate with it, but you can never access the actual actor. And that is something that forces you to do the right thing. And then you can use that reference to send a message to um, the actor in question. Now, actors live in a hierarchy. I just explained to you how we created a top-level actor. Uh, but your place in the hierarchy is defined by your position in it. Um, actors can have child actors and so on and so on and grandchildren. And everything that you make falls under the user actor. This is a user space where all the actors that you create are going to be. There's three def default actors that are always there. It's the root and the user and the system actor. Under the system actor, all the thread schedulers and so on, they are running. Under the user one, we have actually the functional ones that we build ourselves. Now, this address is important. Um, we'll see in a few slides why that is. But there is a concept called supervision in this hierarchy. And supervision is basically how we do fault tolerance. Now, I have three kids. And if I take them to the supermarket, um, ultimately, I'm responsible as a parent. If they run their cart into some lady's ankles, I have to make sure that they apologize. If they knock something over, over I'm going to help clean it up. I mean, if they misbehave, I'm responsible. That's how it works as a parent. And with actors, it is no different. Um, as a parent actor, you are responsible for your children. If an uncaught exception occurs in one of your actors, it is escalated to the parent through a supervision strategy to respond to that failure. And if we respond to that failure, the parent can decide to do a number of things. The parent can decide to uh, kill off the child. Don't do that with your own children. Um, it could basically 
also tell the actor like, okay, this exception is not that, ban uh, that bad, just ignore it and pick up the next message. Or you can basically tell it like, okay, we're gonna restart you. So you basically destroy the actor, recreate it with the same props, but it preserves the entire inbox and it will retry the message on the new instance. Um, that last one is basically the default behavior. And you can either apply this strategy to one of your children or all of them. It depends on what kind of workload you're running. If you cut like a big task into multiple small pieces and delegated them all to little child uh, actors, um, it might be that a single exception invalidates the whole workload. So there's no point in letting all the other children run. So you kill them off all. That's a possibility. I mean, you can do this and you implement this strategy uh, the failure of an actor has to be handled in the parent. And that is, that is the, one of the things that you have to reason about. Now, as you can already feel, you're going to have to reason about your code a little bit differently. And there's a couple of design ideas, like the basic principles, that make it a lot easier to build actors correctly. First of all, split any workload into small chunks and then into smaller chunks, and you create actors for every, every small task. Make them very specific. Single responsibility also translates to actors. But the other thing is, you put high-risk operations. Anything that goes out of your actor system could be high-risk, going to disk, going over the network, going to a database, whatever. It's all tricky. You push that risk as far to the bottom as possible, so that you have an actor that you can restart uh, without hurting all the main actors that have important data in them. Um, so that's like push, push, pushing the risk further down, make sure that you can actually realize that uptime that you really want. And then you have to keep in mind that every actor is basically single threaded. It might run different messages on different threads, but there's never two threads running on a single actor, which means if you overload an actor with so many messages that you cannot realistically process all of them on a single core, this actor will become a bottleneck. The inbox will overflow, you'll start having problems, like don't do that. Design to communicate with the, the correct actors uh, in the correct way. So avoid these bottlenecks in, in your design. Now there's a whole bunch of design patterns that you can use. Um, Petabridge, the people who actually uh, are behind Aka.net and who provide a lot of training, they have a whole course about it. Um, basically how you design fan out workloads. Um, one of the ideas that you always talk through your parent to your uh, siblings. Um, like consensus patterns um, and there's like a single one that I want to highlight because I find it so funny It's the character actor. Are there any Star Trek fans here? Okay, so when a celebrity plays along in one of the one of the shows What do they do with them? They are the character actors like they, they come in they play a role in one or two episodes They arrive at a new planet and they send that guy down Because he's not part of the main cast so they can afford to lose him. He's the character actor. He's in there. It's like, you send him down, do the risky thing. Oh, you died. Oh, sorry. All of us are still alive. Good. Um, so that's what they do in Star Trek. And that's what you should also be doing with your actors. If you are going to do something that you find potentially dangerous. Oh, I thought I had like highlighted stuff in there. You create a child actor to do that task for you. This is your character actor. And whether he fails or succeeds, doesn't really matter because you can deal with that in the parent without losing your important state. So character actors that are, are really together with the supervision strategies are the way that you make your system very resilient. Now enough chit chat about the whole um, actor model. Let me explain to you what the problem was that we were solving when we, uh, we built this thing. Now, this is, what, this is what they look like in Belgium, but I'm pretty sure in Denmark they look pretty similar. So my, my own uh, electricity, gas, and water meter in my house. What do these devices tell you? They give you a number. A number, the amount of consumption that has been measured on this device since it was produ produced at the factory. Most of the time, that matches with the amount of electricity that was measured since it was installed in your house. But not even that is always true because these companies, they reuse meters. Um, 
And if there have been previous owners, I mean, what does, what does the number really say? What we care about is how much that number changes. Because that's what we get billed for. That's the, the stuff. So we were at an IoT company that made devices that connected to these. We could read them optically. There's also digital versions of all of them. Then you can just plug a serial device into it. Um, that was always really fun as well. And what we wanted to do is connect our IoT device to these meters and then send the data over the internet to our backend to be processed, uh, to be analyzed, and to provide insights to the users of our platform. So basically, um, what did we want is we want to have the historic user uh, usage for as long as the device had been connected to the meter. We wanted to store that somewhere, build some graphs on it, put some alerting on it. Um, both momentary thresholds that were exceeded in the consumption as well as like over a longer period of time. If you are constantly using a little bit of water, it means you have a leak somewhere. That's the kind of situations that we were trying to detect. Um, now, the first thing you have to worry about is readings versus consumption. And the reading is the number on the meter. But as long as that doesn't change, you're not being built. So what you really care about is like how much has this number changed over the last five minutes or the last day or so. That's the real value. That's what you'll, you'll get a bill for. So from the blue line, we have to go to the orange bars. We get a certain meter reading, but we actually only care about the differences. Now, since the meters don't output that, that's one of the things that we had to compute in our backend, um, because that's the data you actually want to present to the users. And thresholds are fun as well, because you can have a momentary threshold, and everybody agrees with me, that at 10.30, we went over the red line, and we should raise an alert to the user. Now, if we are talking about a 20-minute threshold, things get trickier already. Because the, the red line is a clear-cut case. We've been over the consumption for five, uh, four blocks in a row. We've hit that threshold. For the green line, it's something else. Because we haven't been over it for four blocks in a row, but we have been over it on average. It's not a problem that I can solve for you, but that's the kind of business questions that you're going to get. Now we tried to build all this kind of stuff, but how does Aka.net fit into this? If you look at your typical IoT stack, and this is like all the Azure examples that you will get with it, but you can get very similar stuff on, on other cloud vendors as well. You'll basically have three parts. Um, on one side, you will have the communication to your devices. Um, we built our own because this didn't exist yet. Um, I would recommend that you don't do that. Like the value you get from IoT Hub, you cannot build that in a better way. The things you're going to want to look for in the communication to your devices is um, presence detection. Is the device online or not? Uh, you want to get uh, events from the device to your backend, but you also want to send control from your backend to the device. Um, and basically, all those things are uh, authenticating devices, stuff like that, is in like ready-made solution. It's a solved. It's a solved problem. You have libraries even for the smallest of microprocessors to talk to these backends. And then you're going to shape and process the data because everything that comes in is raw. You need to do stuff to it. So you're going to need some kind of compute power, whether it be a Kubernetes cluster or service fabric or whatever. I mean, you're gonna, you can do so many things. Um, like process it and store it, but you're still not providing value. So you're going to have to send notifications to the user and build dashboards on top of it and stuff like that. Now. What part of it can we use Aka.net for is basically everything that we, we shape the data and analyze it and, and, and like generate the content of the alerts. That is the part that Aka.net can do and can help us with. It's an alternative to these technologies in this use case, right? So what did our high-level backend look like? Uh, we had an Aka.net cluster um, and from our version of the IoT Hub, we just uh, plug messages off the event stream through a very, very simple app service application that relayed them uh, to our cluster. And basically, that application was something we could turn off when we were redeploying the cluster, made it a lot easier to handle all that. And on top of the cluster, we actually had uh, our web port portals and our alerting and so on. And that all talked to the cluster directly. 
Um, so the cluster was also the gateway tr to the storage. If you wanted to go to the storage, you went through the cluster. I'm not necessarily sure that I would make that design decision again, but it was what we did. Now, if you start thinking about using this, it's really funny, um, because in the other room, there's uh, the guard Gilmore and um, Eamon, Eamon Boyle. They're having a talk about um, what's wrong with our industry, and they had a slide about Magpie development in there, and I had this one in my deck. Um, being a magpie is, go is, is the bird, y y you have this in Denmark as well, right? It's like the bird that steals the shiny things. It's not really true, but it's the myth that is uh, attached to this bird. It's like, what we developers often do is like, oh, this shiny new thing, I want to use it in my next project, whether it is a fit or not. So think about if the problem you're, you're actually solving benefits from using an actor model. And Everything that is high throughput stateful systems will benefit from it. Like gaming backends, um, stock trading systems, IoT applications, um, all that type of thing works really well. But it'll never be your whole solution. You're always going to need things around it. Now, I want to show you a couple of uh, technical parts of our implementation th so that you have a feel for the code and, and how you solve certain problems. I have four of them. I might get through all of them. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, four problems that we had to solve and how we did that inside the actor model. And the first is normalizing, uh, normalizing our measurements. Um, getting messages to our actor system is a problem that we had to solve. How we dealt with persisting data and how we dealt with restarting uh, um, the applications. Now, normalizing measurements. Um, these meters, they are the weirdest things. And as I told you, some of them we read optically. So we had a small camera that would actually... If, if you know the last digit of your meter, it always has like a reflective dot on it. So you can basically glue something on the display, and whenever the reflective dot passes, you know that it made one iteration. So you can use that to guesstimate a little bit how, mo how often the meter uh, spanned through. But it's, it's not completely consistent. Also, the serial ones, they didn't have error correction in the serial protocol. So sometimes you would get like a flipped bit in there somewhere and you get a huge spike in your measurements and a huge drop and then it would like continue as normal. So that's the stuff that we had to deal with um, only after we had those problems in production, of course. Um, so we figured that we needed to normalize data in some way um, because it's so much easier in all of your business logic code in our problem domain if you know that buckets are exactly every five minutes um, and they are all exactly on the five minute mark timestamp. And if we have missing data because internet connections do go down Users do unplug their devices. I mean, you miss data from time to time. Um, if you have missing data, we're going to fill in the gaps so that you have a continuous stream of measurement data in any downstream actor where we're actually writing business logic. And we could do this in every actor, but it would be so much easier if we could do that in one place because then we can have like a single algorithm that does all of the normalization for us have that in one place and then not worry about it anymore in the rest of our business logic. So if you have raw data, I mean, there's uh, some of these devices had like a two kilobyte, uh, had like two kilobytes of RAM. I'm not saying two megabytes, I'm saying like two kilobytes. So constructing an HTTP request on these devices was already really complex. So a real time clock, just not present. So what you'll get is clock drift. Every couple of hours that uh, you go one second off. And that, that multiplies through time. So you need like timestamp correction. You need to try and get to these buckets on the right and you need to interpolate values. It's not complex. I mean, this is very, very simple interpolation. But you have to get from this kind of data to like nice round timestamps and r uh, nice round readings. Um, we also calculated, based on the meter readings, we calculated the consumption in that place as well. Then we had the values that we cared about, the consumption, and not the readings. 
Now, once we were doing that, how many animations are in this slide? Okay. Another problem that once we had those, we had the problem of gaps. Because sometimes you have a certain amount of time that you don't get a reading back. And if it's a digital meter, it means you can get the accurate reading again as soon as the device comes online again. If it's one of those reflective dot things, it might have actually like looped through a couple of times while you had the power unplugged, so you have like a physical disconnect between the readings that are sending and, and the actual meter. That's a worse problem, and you cannot solve that in software. Um, but at some point, you're going to have to fill it in, and you have to worry what you're going to do about it. And it's very easy. It's like, OK, we have the amount of consumption that we know happened in that period, and we have the amount of time that was spent, so we can do a number of things to it. We can either not fill it at all because we don't know what the correct distribution is, so let's like not do it. This is probably like the best one. Um, but yeah, users want to see graphs, so and the, the the total sum of the consumption has to add up. So you can put it in as a peak, like a single reading. You can put it at the middle or at the start or at the end. It doesn't really matter. Or you can evenly split it into three parts. Works really well. Looks really shit if you miss a day of data, because then you have a day where your consumption is like a flat line that is almost never the reality. Or you could try and follow a trend line. And we did something similar to this. What we did was actually more complex than what I can show on this slide. We looked at the same time frame of the week before and looked what the trend line looked like in this period. And then we adjusted the height of all the bars for the total consumption that we actually knew had happened in our period so that we would have something that looked like last week's consumption during that period. Which is a good guesstimate, it's still wrong. All of these are wrong, there is no right way to fill it in. You have to decide to pick something that works for your problem domain, something that you find acceptable, something that you uh, can work with. It might be important, for instance, to let your downstream business logic know that this data has been gap filled. Because if you know that it has been gap filled, you can make the decision to maybe not raise alerts on it. Because you know that it's not accurate, you might not want to trigger alerts on this system. Something that can, uh, can be done. Now how we do that in actors is actually not that hard. You spawn a child actor that does just this. All the measurements from the device, from the IoT hub, they come in and you relay, you relay them to this one actor that holds a little bit of state. It remembers the last message. It remembers the one that, the one that comes, uh, it gets the one that comes in right now. It makes the diff, it creates normalized readings. If there is a, a gap of more than five minutes between uh, those two, then you generate a new one. It might be a day, then you need to gap fill. You do all of that in this actor and its children. And then what it sends back to its parent actor, because that's a very common communication pro um, uh, um, pattern that you see in actors, is communicate through your parent actor. It's like you report back to your parents, like this is what I've done. Here are the normalized values. And the normalized values is, are what the device actor will send on to all of its downstream actors. And oh yeah, this had highlighting then. Okay, great. Um, but yeah, I explained all that. So this normalization, you do it in one place, and then it makes writing the rest of your application so much easier. So if you work with any kind of data that needs to be cleaned, where you know that there are inconsistencies, um, do that. It's a pattern that you'll love using. Now the next problem that we had to solve is like, we can build a very nice cluster, um, an Alka.net cluster, but we have to send messages to it, because our actors live in there, but from the outside we have to get messages to it. And I told you earlier that the address that you have in your actor system is important. And it's also important because of Akka.remote. Akka.remote is an actor system, uh, a way to talk to an actor system from another actor system. So what you do as a, cha as, as a client application is you, spa you spawn your own uh, local actor system where you generate the top level actors and then you have the references and you can talk to your own actors. And those will actually use the Akka remote uh, package to talk to the other actor system at the other end of the line. 
And the cool thing about this uh, addressing is uh, this is basically the same way that we construct URLs in a, a whole bunch of problems. Um, so you have a, a protocol, you have a name of an actor system, you have a location where it lives like an IP address with a port, and you have the path of, of the actor you're trying to talk to. Now this actor path um, is something that uh, we can use inside an actor reference. We can create an actor reference with this. And the cool thing about actor references is they have something called location transparency. So if you send an actor reference along in a, a message to another actor, even if it lives in another node of your cluster or in a remote actor system, the actor reference still works for talking to that actor. So you can pass this around inside your cluster and have a reference to talk to the actor and you don't have to know where it lives, you just have the actor reference that you can talk to this. So this remoting is important, but how do we implement that if we want to build a bigger system? Now the first thing, as I said, we do is we create a small client actor system where we will have our proxies. And if we get a message for a new device, we just create a new proxy for it. And that proxy will be responsible to talk to our main actor system, our remote actor system. So that proxy upon startup will send a message to the other side and ask like, hey, do you have a device actor for this device ID that I just got? And either it will get created or the device orchestrator will already have one. Um, and it will send a quick reply back like, okay, here is the actor reference to talk to that device actor that I either just created or that was already there, right? And from then on, this proxy can just talk to that actor directly, the, de the specific device actor. It doesn't have to go through the device manager. Remember that I told you about these uh, bottleneck actors. This is how you avoid them. And everything that gets relayed off the stream uh, can just be sent through, through the proxy directly to the device actor, and we can do that. Now there's, there's a bit of code, and there's a couple of bits that I want to show you in here. Is first of all, um, we have something called pre-start, and that is code that is handled in the actor before it actually accepts its first message of the inbox. So if your actor needs to do stuff before it actually does anything else, uh, you can use things like pre-start. And if you want to create, uh, talk to an actor based on um, based on something else, um, I lost something here. Oh yeah, if you want to do an, 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 an selection based on an address and you don't have the actor reference yet, you can do an actor selection for a certain path and it will give you um, a selection back that you can actually also tell. Um, and then if we get the connected confirmation back from the other side, we just store the device reference from the other side in a rector and we can continue with that. Now you might have noticed that we are using the receive actor now and this is a much more uh, convenient way to build actors because they are strongly typed regarding uh, of the messages that come in and you map them in the constructor by uh, or any uh, other method um, by uh, calling on the receive and then that function will get called if a message from that type comes in. It makes much cleaner actors. And a trick I always use because I remember um, Remember that I told you that the props are basically a constructor pointer. Um, the tricky thing is if you create props, you have to like pass the right parameters of the right type to your um, create props method. What I always do is I create a static method for every actor that has the same parameters as the constructor of that actor. And every time I, I use it in another place in my code to spawn an instance of that actor, I use that create props method. Uh, that way, if I'm refactoring and I add a parameter to the constructor, all of the code breaks. Actor props.create will not break because it just takes a params array of, of objects. And yeah, I mean, so that's something I, I always do. Um, this is like the devices actor, the device manager. It will just create it. I'm going to skip over this real quick. Now, um, how are we on time? We're good, we're good. Persisting data, because up to now, we've been speaking about actors that live in memory, that have their own state, that do all these um, cool things. Um, but what do we do if we recycle the process? There's always data that you don't want to 
don't want to lose, stuff that needs to get persisted. Now, Aka.net has a uh, built-in persistent model that is basically event sourced. So you're not storing the state as such, you're basically storing the messages that save, that mutate your state. Um, and it's not really that complex to do. All you have to remember is that in the storage technology that you choose to use, there will always be um, an ID that identifies your specific actor and that needs to be unique. Um, and if events come in, you can just persist them and they will get replayed when the actor starts up again. So if you create an actor um, that inherits from the persistent actor, it will actually query the underlying uh, event stored database to get all the messages that should be played back on the actor before it actually starts accepting stuff on the on the inbox in the Im on the inbox sorry so what does that look like you can do the receive persistent actor and you have a persistence id that's the easy part what i also always do is i group all my state into a state object um, so that I can basically mutate the state by calling methods on that state. It makes snapshotting so much easier because if you also have a snapshot uh, mechanism where you can pers persist the entire state to your snapshot store so that when you recover um, after a reboot, you can just get your snapshot and then replay the messages since the, the snapshot makes it much easier to do that as well. Now, instead of receive, we now have things like command and recover. Command are things that are coming from the inbox and recover are messages that come from the underlying event store. So these are messages that you stored in the past that were replayed on the previous instance of this actor and that are now being replayed to recreate. And you can map them to different methods. Uh, the reason that that is important is you don't want to call persist on a recover message. If it's already coming from your persisted event store, you don't want to persist it again because that will create loops every time you, you restart your rectors. So in the command, you will persist it and then it will call the underlying method, the internal one, that actually mutates the state. But on the recover, you're only going to call the state mutation and not persist it again. And you can snapshot every 100 messages or whatever mechanism you choose, you're in full control there. Now, if you have, um, if you do all this, you can make very, very quick um, decisions about which messages need to be persisted in your, um, in your store. And basically, it's all the ones that will change your state. You often have message types that don't change your state, like every query to an actor about its state is often something that doesn't need to be persisted. Um, that's why they give you full control. You can persist the ones that really matter. Now, the snapshots, um, that's the first thing you get back. You get a snapshot offer back, and your state object is in there. So as I said, if you group everything into a state object, it's very easy. You will never forget any fields that you needed to persist. Um, so that's how I always deal with persistent actors. You can um, deal because saving a snapshot is something that happens asynchronously so you can deal with the success or the failure of your snapshot as well now how do we apply this in in the bigger scheme of things because persisting actors um, is a very good idea it's like we're going to save all our state what you cannot do is persist all your actors because that will make your system terribly slow because everything has to go to storage so what I always do is try and figure like what is the root of um, the stuff that I'm persisting here and have one persistent actor in that hierarchy. And for us, it was for a single device, a single meter, we wanted to persist the message stream. And all the other actors that needed um, data from it would actually use that one. Now, there's two types of data that you have to think about. There is operational data like the data that you need to actually keep your system running. For us, it was the window that we wanted to look at for our alerting. Typically like a day or maybe a week worth of data. You don't want to keep all data for all eternity in memory. It doesn't really make sense. It's not the graph that the user usually looks at. They want to see like, how is my consumption today? 
and occasionally they will swipe back and look at, at yesterday's or like last week's or last month's or last year's. But there's no reason to keep all that in hot storage. You want to put that in cold storage. So you'll basically have two, act, uh, two ways of dealing with that data. You have one actor that basically pers persists your cold data to some kind of storage outside of your actor system, typically a database or, or whatever. Um, and then you have one, and then you use the built-in ACA persistence to keep a trimmed down version of the state that you actually need to run your data, like your hot data. And that will actually get recovered when you restart the actor system, but all the cold storage is just going to live in the database until it's queried. And that's a trade-off, because all of these actors, they do live in RAM. So if you this truncation of, of your operational data is something you really need to worry about as soon as you go to millions of devices because that's every kilobyte that you have for every device is, is going to hurt you and going to cost a lot of money. On cloud vendors, RAM is typically like the most expensive storage that you can get. So when these normalized meter readings come in on our device actor, um, we forward them to the value storage. And the value storage is typically a persistent actor. This is our hot data, right? So it will persist the message and do a periodic snapshot. It will also truncate its own state based on the window that we defined, right? But what it will also do is it will offload anything that hasn't been persisted to cold storage periodically to a child or actor again, where it can be stored in the historic yeah, measurement database. So we can allow users to keep their data for all eternity. It will just cost us a lot less than RAM. Um, and because they, these all live in the hierarchy, we can just query that data through um, that actor if we want to. It's just not going to live in memory. Now we have one actor that stores everything. But as you can imagine, you're going to have actors that are calculating and generating alerts they need data, so if the system gets restarted, they might want to re-query their own window of, of operation, right? If we're defining an alert that needs like an hour of measurements to trigger an alert condition, yeah, we're going to have to get that data to that actor. And if we make all of them persistent, as I just said, that's not a good idea. So what we want to do is when our system restarts, we want to create um, actors for all of our devices that we know about and like re rebuild our cache of memory um, for all of them. So it's ideal to have like one persistent actor, but we're going to need so many other actors that are actually doing stuff with that data. So on startup, they will all query the persistent actor through the parent. And they will query that data, and as soon as the persistent actor has actually restored its state, because that's how they work, they do that first, they can start accepting inbox messages, and they can reply with the data that the other actor needs to start doing its job. And since that are, because the, the, the actors and your own children, by default, they spawn on the same node, so you'll be on the same machine, it'll be bloody fast to query that data and pass it around between the actors, there's only a single one that actually reads from your storage, uh, your underlying storage technology. So it will create its children, and the storage actor will actually query the underlying store, and all the other ones will just request it, and the storage actor will reply. And that's how you build a new uh, a system after a reboot or a crash or whatever. Um, usually, uh, it never crashed. It was always on a redeploy that we were facing this scenario. Already out of time? Yes. I thought it was one hour. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm standing between you and lunch. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, I have like two minutes to wrap up? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna... So there's a lot of things that we didn't talk about today. Um, configuration management, um, how you set up your cluster, how you deal with logging and all of that. Um, and dependency injection, although it's an empty pattern, is something you can also do. There are so many things that you need to do when you bring a system like this to production. I have a whole workshop about that, if you want. Um, there's also great information out there. I mean, the people at Petabridge have an amazing blog and a free um, 
a free boot camp that you can take on GitHub. There are some courses on Plural Sites. Um, they blog about everything that they make, every new feature. So a lot of the info is just ready and out there if you're willing to look for it. Um, if you're still stuck or your team wants to start doing this, they offer paid training as well. And it is really good because you will get trained by the people who actually built the thing. So that's, that's amazing. Um, and deployment is also something you need to worry about um, because at the moment that you redeploy your cluster um, because of a new release or whatever, um, all your actors will get torn down, will get recreated, and that's something you have to plan for. So usually you will stop your message stream, redeploy, and restart the message stream af after everything uh, has been created. Automate that, like don't leave that to chance with manual steps, uh, because the junior will always forget to do one of them. Um, I think that's it. Like my conclusion is very easy. It's like first check if your problem domain is fit for actors and decide what part of the solution you're going to use it for. Design your hierarchy in a way that you don't have bottlenecks and with the, uh, the right communication patterns. And normalizing your data will help you a lot if you're building a system like this. Think about your deployment. Think about how it will handle recycle. My name is Hannes. I work for a company called Access in Belgium. Uh, this is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. Make ICQ great again. Uh, you can find the code samples on uh, GitHub. Um, I'm going to clear out, but if you have questions, you're more than welcome to come and talk to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs>